Wednesday, May 15th meeting of the Amherst Planning Board and Zoning Subcommittee. Uh, we're going to be joined a little bit later in the meeting by our friends who are present here from the Town Council's Community Resource Committee. We have a couple items before we get to that joint meeting, the first being announcements and minutes. And I believe we have the minutes of Wednesday, May 1st here in our packets. Are there any comments on the minutes of Wednesday, May 1st? All right, we'll consider those minutes approved. Thank you. Are there any announcements? All right, seeing none. The next item is public comment, and this is public comments for items not related to items that are occurring further down the agenda. Is there any such public comment? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to the next item. And this is the joint meeting with the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council to discuss the process of working on zoning amendments and other matters. And we have uh, this Community Resource Committee is here. Their chair, Steve Schreiber, will be co-chairing this portion of the meeting with me. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. So I officially called to order the CRC um, meeting also. We have a quorum. Would it be helpful if we did introductions? That would be very helpful. Yeah. So I'm, well, I'm Steve Schreiber. I'm a town councilor, chair of the Community Resource Committee and former planning board member, and actually former zoning subcommittee member. So it's good to be back. Good to have you. Dorothy Pam, member of Community Resources Committee. Pat DeAngelis, Community Resources. Andy Steinberg from the council and the committee. Kathy Shane on the council, but not on the committee, so I'm part of your public. Greg Stutzman, Planning Board and Zoning Subcommittee. David Levenstein, Planning Board and Zoning Subcommittee. Chris Brestra, Planning Director. Lynn Griesmer, President of the Town Council and actually here as a member of the audience. Chris. I wonder if I might just point out what is in the packet before you get started with your meeting just so you understand the resources that are available to you here. Please do. So the first item that you have in your packet is a colorful sheet of paper that the Zoning Subcommittee and the Planning Board have been working on for a number of years, putting together uh, their priorities for um, zoning amendments. And the blue section is what they consider the higher priority, the uh, pink section is the secondary priority, and the green section is the third priority. So that's kind of an over overview. The second thing you have in your packet is um, a copy of Section 5 from Chapter 40A of the uh, uh, Mass General Law. This was something that was provided to us by Bob Ritchie, who is working on the uh, Bylaw Review Committee. Um, and it, uh, it traces the process by which one or by which a town or a city can change its zoning. And since we are um, changing our form of government from town meeting to town council, we thought this might be helpful. Um, the third thing is three, it's a little packet that's stapled together, and it's three zoning amendments that are just in their early stages of being put together. Um, and uh, the zoning <coughs> subcommittee is um, considering whether they want to present these as a first packet to town council. And we can uh, talk about them individually as we get into the meeting. Um, the fourth uh, item is a memorandum. And I, uh, the reason I included this in the packet is because uh, Ms. Pam brought up um, a, a question about uh, the, the desire by the planning board to change its voting requirements for site plan review. So this is a memo I wrote, um, I think it was back in February because our planning board members had similar questions. So you obviously can't read that right now, but you might want to read it at your leisure, and it will give the history of why we arrived at the voting requirements that we have now and um, potential reasons for wanting to change uh, those voting requirements. And then the fourth thing is a report to town meeting on one of the zoning amendments that is included in the little stapled packet. It has to do with supplemental dwellings, and I thought that would be helpful to you because supplemental dwellings was already brought to town meeting, and town meeting uh, didn't um, adopt it for a variety of reasons at that time, 
which you can go into <coughs> later, but this uh, memorandum from the planning board will give you a sense of why the planning board thought this was an important um, topic. So that's, uh, that is your packet in a nutshell. Great, thank you so much for that overview. And to give a little more background on why we're here today and why the zoning subcommittee thought it wise to invite the CRC to have a conversation with us, we understand that the presentation was given to the CRC um, on zoning this afternoon. And we had considered um, attending that meeting and having that meeting be a joint meeting of the two bodies. But it seemed to make more sense to have that discussion take place here to provide more time for the presentation by staff earlier this afternoon. So we're here to have a conversation uh, with the CRC about how we might proceed with uh, zoning, uh, answer any questions about how that's been happening up to this point, and again, uh, look at how we might move forward. Thank you. Chris. I forgot one item. Um, you also have on your desks a packet that um, is representative of a presentation that the building commissioner gave today, and one of the sheets in here may be helpful to you in discussing um, what you would envision going forward in terms of a process for amending zoning. I can't remember which page it's on, but I'll, I'll look that up, and when the time comes, I'll be able to refer that to you. Thank you. So first I'd ask if there were any comments, questions on the presentation that was given today. Do um, CRC members have questions or comments for the zoning subcommittee about any of the information we heard earlier today? Um, as, I, as I said to Dave in the break, um, what for me would be most useful are case studies. Um, kind of like what you did on a certain thing, what problems arose, how you proceeded, so that we have just a better idea of how things work. Chris. Is Ms. Pam um, imagining that those case studies would be in the form of written material or would be presented orally at a meeting? Orally. Live and now or in the if future? <laughs> Case studies of what? Of, of decisions that you made, or how it worked, how a particular a pro, something is presented to you, how you proceed, and what happened. Well, we can speak about the process under the prior form of government, in which typically um, proposals that would be brought forth by the planning board um, would be discussed first by the zoning subcommittee, uh, working from base materials such as the priorities document that's been presented in the packet today, which again has been um, created over a, a large number of years, so uh, inspiration might be drawn from that. It might be drawn from current issues that arise and uh, the conversations we have at the planning board. And once an idea is circulated amongst the zoning subcommittee, staff will work with the zoning subcommittee to refine it. It would then be brought to the planning board for further discussion, and as noted in some of the materials in our packet, any zoning change requires a public hearing by the planning board. And under our previous form of government, after the planning board had held the public hearing, it would make a recommendation to town meeting, and town meeting would ultimately vote on the proposal. We also have, in the past, had zoning petitions brought by citizens. Those can be brought to the zoning subcommittee, to the planning board. There was a uh, requirement for number of signatures in order for that proposal to be brought directly to town meeting. And in a number of cases, the petitioners would work with the zoning subcommittee and the planning board to refine their proposal and to seek the approval and endorsement of the planning board. Um, again, the public hearing held by the planning board is a mandatory requirement for all these zoning matters. So in some cases, petitioners would work closely with the board and the subcommittee. In some cases, petitioners would draft their own language and not work as closely with the two board, the board and the committee. Um, but in either case, again, the planning board would hold a public hearing on the matter. It's, um, oh. Maria? I was gonna add um, another scenario which was at one point, one of the planning board members wanted to bring a certain item to the agenda um, and wanted to discuss housing. 
And so um, it was sort of instigated in the planning board, and then it was sort of given to the, sub, the zoning subcommittee members to sort of brainstorm some ideas and options, and then we brought it back to the planning board. So there was that kind of back and forth as well. And then it would fall into the process that Greg has just stated. But um, So the ideas come from various sources, but that was one that came up. Yeah, there was one or two additional elements of the process because the finance committee as it existed at the time and the select board also received presentations of proposals before they went to town meeting. And the result was uh, whether to uh, recommend or not recommend, and that was not exclusive to um, zoning proposals, but was to all things. The Finance Committee t um, tried very hard to focus in on the financial implications of a proposed change in making its recommendations, which was always the source of some level of debate within the Finance Committee. Uh, Select Board was acting in a broader sense in whether it would recommend or not. And uh, I think that the question for uh, the uh, Community Resources Committee is to what, to what extent it is acting in a similar capacity um, as something flows from the uh, planning board to the council or whether we have some other role that we're seeking to define. And I think that's what I'm trying to understand right now. One thing I was having trouble remembering from when we were discussing this earlier, so we had, in the old days, we had the citizen petitions, and then we had the planning board generated um, zoning articles. In the case of citizen petitions, those would always go ahead, even if there was a negative vote re recommendation on the part of the planning board. When the planning board had a negative recommendation on its own zoning articles, did that continue to move ahead? Did we ever forward anything that was generated by the planning board that had a negative vote? I think typically the issue that would come into play was the timing of the warrant yeah. being issued. And so there were some cases I can recall where uh, the planning board may have decided it did not want to proceed with supporting an article, but the warrant had already been drafted yeah. and so it appeared on the warrant. And there were other cases where the decision was made to withdraw the article prior to the drafting of the warrant yeah. and it did not go ahead. So those were kind of technical yeah. reasons, but any time mm -hmm. there's a, like a, I can't think of. I think your point may in part be that a petitioner had the right to proceed to town meeting yeah. even yeah. if it did not have the support of the planning board for yeah. its proposal, yeah. and that's absolutely true. But, but the planning board itself, if they were the petitioner, would not, or if they were the generator, would not. If they, we recommend four to five, we would not, it would not advance after that. In the case of an article the planning yeah. board itself had placed on the warrants. Yeah. Again, I think it comes to the matter I mentioned with the timing, so there were yeah, cases that went each way. way. And there are some cases in which a petitioner brought an article to the planning board and the planning board adopted it as their own and then proceeded to be the supporting body when it came to town meeting. Chris. I just wanted to mention um, an interesting case study for Ms. Pan's benefit that um, last spring, actually it started in the winter of, of 2018, um, Jerry Weiss, who had been a select board member, was very concerned about affordable housing and, um, and was really interested in bring, bringing a, um, a warrant article on inclusionary housing, inclusionary zoning. And um, you know, we have discussed this over the years and various uh, efforts have been made to pass inclusionary zoning bylaws and, and we do have an inclusionary zoning bylaw but it's not perfect. So uh, Mr. Weiss came forward and said that he really wanted to work on this and he drafted something up, and um, he came to the zoning subcommittee and he said, well, here's what I think. Um, now, I'd like to work with you to hear what you think and potentially come up with something that is really, uh, that will pass town meeting and will be favorable to everybody. So um, he did come up with his own version, 
And um, he kept that as a petition article that did go through the petition yeah. process. But at the same time, he worked with the zoning subcommittee and the planning board to come up with something that was what he eventually thought was better than what he had come up with originally. His petition article was kind of, um, he had to submit it because of timing issues. So it was kind of cast in stone. And then time went forward and um, the planning board's version was eventually passed by town meeting last spring. So I think that was a really good um, kind of scenario for how something uh, started out as a petition article but was worked on by both the petitioner and the planning board and eventually came to town meeting and was passed with I think it was a very good um, number of people who One of voted for it. Biggest, biggest margins <laughs> for a zoning bylaw change mm -hmm. in the many long time. And I suppose to give some further background on the workings of the zoning subcommittee, we've been paying attention through staff to town council and its evolving work and its evolving subcommittees. And um, the document you see in your packet today, the priorities, the, the colored packet, is the result of the work of the zoning subcommittee over the last few months in drafting a proposal we could bring to town council that might instruct us, be a sort of a roadmap uh, to what zoning priorities may be. And the reason that there are some specific articles included in here with their draft language uh, prepared by staff in some cases and past planning board in some cases is because the zoning subcommittee felt that these articles um, were fairly straightforward and discussion of them could be a good starting point for the CRC and the town council as it discusses zoning. Um, so we have the three articles in the packet. One relates to marijuana uses and that has been a topic of much citizen discussion at our zoning subcommittee meetings recently. There's been concern from some citizens that although the town has supported permitting marijuana businesses since the legalization, that the way the current zoning is structured is significantly more prohibitive than the relative state guidelines, especially when it comes to cultivation, research, and similar non-retail uses. So the zoning subcommittee has met with some concerned citizens on this issue and staff has drafted some language that might make it more possible than it now is to have these cultivation research and similar uses located in the town. I thought we might just go through these articles one by one. So that's one. Uh, are there any questions, comments on that article? Um, on the marijuana article? Um, well, I did read it and um, I, I was wondering about, we start off with 500 feet, we have 200 feet, and we go to 300 feet for different things. Um, and nowhere does it mention selling. Um, it talks about cultivating, manufacturing, processing, research, testing. But, so selling is exempt from these? I'm just kind of curious about that. Chris? So this is a first draft, and the way the first draft is set up is that um, the 500 feet is mandated by the state. All of these marijuana uses need to be 500 feet from schools. Um, that's part of the state uh, Cannabis Control Commission regulations. Then um, the planning board and the zoning subcommittee were grappling with the issue of, are there certain marijuana uses that are less um, threatening than others? And um, based on what we've heard from farmers and also from landowners who are interested in doing cultivation, research, testing, et cetera. Um, the zoning subcommittee felt that uh, those particular uses were less threatening than, say, a retail use, and that, that those particular uses might be allowed to be a little bit closer to um, certain, um, certain other types of uses than the retail or something like that. So the way this is drafted is that those uses related to cultivation, research, testing, manufacturing, and processing, which don't involve somebody going in and buying something, they just involve a manufacturing process, might be allowed to be within 200 feet of certain other uses, like a residence or a pharmacy or another marijuana establishment. And then the 300 feet applies to every other use aside from cultivation, manufacturing, processing, and testing. So the, the, the third part of this encompasses all of those uses, including retail. So, but nowhere does it mention, something I read a while ago about marijuana talked about 
smell and odor and limits, and I don't see that in here. That's all part of another portion of the bylaw which wasn't proposed to be changed. So that's all taken care of in another portion of the bylaw. Any other comments on the marijuana article? Chris? There's one other comment. I'm sorry I'm talking so much, but um, <laughs> there was one other comment that I did not um, fully understand the um, intent of the zoning subcommittee when they met last time, and one of the intents was to um, potentially even eliminate the 300-foot buffer for all uh, uses related to marijuana for everything but schools and residences. So. Um, I haven't drafted that up yet, but the next time we meet, I will draft that up. I think what the idea was, and perhaps Ms. Chow can express this better than I can, but I think the idea was that all of the uses that are not retail uses could be allowed to be um, right next to other uses except for residences. Does that, does that capture it? I think that's correct. Just residences, yes, because um, the particular petitioner, community member who came up, um, his property was in an RN, I believe, and I think that was what he was um, asked. His ask was anything but dispensaries to be within. Basically, there, yeah, there's no buffer between that and a residence, uh, and that's not addressed in this. Chris, so that's something that I'll be presenting to you next time you meet. Right. Thought we may move on to the voting requirements article, and I believe uh, some background was given on this already, and we have even further background in a memorandum prepared by planning staff in our packet. But uh, essentially, the planning board encountered an issue with the adoption of the new charter, where our new size of seven required a look at how the voting requirements were worded, and we found a further complication in the fact that the voting requirements are spelled out both in the zoning bylaw and in our own planning board rules and regulations. Now, a change to the zoning bylaw would have the requirements that we've previously discussed and would be a matter for town council. The planning board rules and regulations are changeable by the planning board itself with a majority vote after a public hearing. So seeing that we had these two instances that could potentially come into conflict, the planning board recently uh, started to pursue the approach of removing a reference to the voting requirements from the planning board rules and regulations and relying on that version which lives in the zoning bylaw. And we were waiting to hear back from the town attorney about his thoughts on our proposed revision before proceeding with changes to the planning board rules and regulations and before proceeding with a potential change to the zoning as it relates to planning board voting requirements. But one of the main issues is that if the requirement stays as written, that the voting requirement, therefore, would become a higher percentage of what it had previously been in terms of the overall membership, the voting membership. And if we were to adopt the change, I believe it would end up being a slightly less percentage um, of the voting members. Any comments or questions on this article? Chris? So um, I did a fair amount of research on this back in February, and uh, Ms. Gray Mullen actually did a fair amount of research too, and she and I um, kind of put our heads together and came up with this, what this memo talks about. Um, essentially back in the 1980s, and I shared some of this information earlier with the CRC, but back in the 1980s, um, Amherst adopted site plan review uh, as a process. Prior to that, they had just had a um, special permit process. And the special permit process uh, requires a two-thirds vote um, to be approved. And so when the town adopted the site plan review process, they felt that they should try to mimic the special permit process as, as much as possible so that people would feel comfortable adopting this new um, regulation. And so they required a two-thirds vote of the, the planning board to approve um, whatever was being proposed. But then later on, um, it became clear that uh, the special permit was really something that was um, you know, discretionary and uh, required kind of a higher bar to be approved. A site plan review should be really something that is considered to be 
that the use is allowed, but the planning board can tell the applicant how to do the use, you know, how many trees to plant, how many lights to put up, whatever. Um, so the, the planning board decided to um, look at reducing that number. So what they did is instead of reducing the number, they said, well, we'll still require the two-thirds, but then we'll say instead of requiring six to vote for site plan review, they said, well, we'll only require five out of nine. So they had this kind of dual thing that if all nine members were there, they'd require two-thirds vote, and if, but if n all nine members weren't there, you could get away with or have or um, achieve uh, success with only five members voting. So this has been looked at by, um, by us and by other cities and towns, and other cities and towns have decided that they only um, will require a majority for site plan review. And on page three, you can see a list of some representative cities and towns that are only requiring a majority for site plan review. So we feel that that is really the direction that the town should move in. You can get a lot more detail about the history of this process and how we got to where we are by reading this memo. I won't go through too much of it now. But um, essentially, it seems like this is the wave of most cities and towns in Massachusetts, that they only require a majority vote for site plan review, whereas they require two-thirds vote for a special permit. Thank you. So, if it, so one of the issues is simply a quorum, or getting the same five people or, or whatever to, to vote. I have two questions. One is if the planning board fails to act on a site plan review, is it, is it, um, it falls in the favor of the applicant, yes? So if the planning board fails to act, then the, the, the application is? Constructively approved. It's constructively approved. So the second question I have, so that would be an argument in favor of a smaller, now that the planning board is smaller, of having a smaller number of, you know, approvals so that that doesn't happen. But the second question is regarding another change that's happened is the mm, Mullen rule, right? The remote participation. So, so we have adopted that for planning board, yes? Yes. But you have to be present to vote. Yeah. Two different, yeah. Okay. Two different things. One is the Mullen rule where you can miss one of the yeah, yeah, yeah. public hearing Promote. sessions yeah. but come in afterwards and as long as you um, read, read all the material and you know watch the video and become familiar with everything, then you can vote. Um, the other thing is um, remote participation which requires that there be a quorum at the meeting itself you, and you can participate remotely. And so the, all the boards and committees in town actually yeah. have that advantage. Okay, so let's say that, um, if I may, Steve. Um, <laughs> um, so, so as long as there's a quorum in the room, but it doesn't have to be the same quorum that started the hearing. Like if the multi -hear it's a multi-meeting hearing, it doesn't have to be the same five people or the same quorum in the room for the vote to happen, and people can vote for the final application remotely by roll call? No, you have to be present to vote. You have to be present to vote. Okay. Does, David? Does participating remotely count as being present when they were voting for that number? I have only experienced the Mullen rule where someone misses one session and reviews the material and then comes in at a next session, a subsequent session, and votes. I have not experienced the remote participation um, and what that, how that affects voting. So that's something that we need to look into. I think Steve, maybe, well, I'll be serious. Steve, I think, I think that th those are, those are good points about sort of practicalities of being able to um, enable the process, the planning board process and the voting to go on for the particular things. For me, I do think it's more a more fundamental, the more fundamental point is just that the site plan as it developed historically, I think was has, is now understood to be, have a lower threshold than, a, than granting of a special permit. Again, the, the distinction that, as I understood it in my 
you know, learning curve is that, that the site plan review is one that enables the town to regulate, to put conditions on the project, but essentially the, the applicants proposing uses that are permitted by the zoning bylaw, as opposed to a special permit, and so a lower threshold. A special permit is, these are discretionary uses that are being petitioned for, being requested, and so a greater, uh, a higher bar is sort of logical to me. That's not clear in the current rules. We have an opportunity to revise that rule while also um, um, can, you know, getting it out of potential redundancy by just putting it in the zoning bylaws rather than zoning bylaws and planning board rules. Any other comments on this article? All right, let's move on. Well, I, I think it's, uh, so long before there was a charter change, there was a, there, we had a investigation instance. There's, there's been an interest in the possibility of reducing from nine to seven for a while. And it was during those zoning subcommittee studies that we discovered, you know, all of these different places. The fact that the number of planning board members wasn't defined in you know, in the town bylaws, but it was defined in the zoning bylaws. So I think reducing the number of places you have to look for membership and for voting requirements, no matter what the outcome is, is a step in the right direction. All right, shall we move on to the, the last article? So this is uh, supplemental dwelling units. And to provide some background on this, probably about five years ago, the planning board uh, looked at ways to promote the production of more diverse housing stock in town. Uh, we looked at possibly allowing for smaller houses on small lots, um, a type of development called a pocket neighborhood, which would allow for a number of small houses on a relatively small parcel compared to density requirements that we otherwise have. And the one proposal that we did end up bringing forward to town meeting and passed was one to allow supplemental detached dwelling units in the town. And the town had previously and still does permit accessory attached dwelling units. These are units of up to 800 square feet or 900 square feet in size if they're handicapped accessible, which are attached to a principal dwelling. And we saw that the trend around the country in order to produce again a more diverse housing stock was to allow for a supplemental or as they're more commonly known accessory dwelling units. Um, there are some model bylaw changes that the state has been looking to pass for some time, which would uh, ease the permitting of accessory dwelling units up to 900 square feet in size. And so the planning board brought forth an article that would allow detached supplemental dwelling units in Amherst, and that uh, passed town meeting with the size uh, limits of 800 square feet or 900 square feet if they are handicapped accessible. And while that bylaw found some success in that a small number of these have been permitted, and I believe that number is maybe in the neighborhood of 10, and perhaps staff has a, a better number than that in that ballpark. So they haven't proliferated in a, in a major way, but there have been some, which has been encouraging. And the purpose of this article was to encourage further production of these units. Uh, I should note that one of the reasons that this was adopted and supported by town meeting was that there's an owner occupancy requirement. So there had been some concerns that this could lead to um, a boom in solely renter-occupied housing, but the owner-occupied requirement um, was well received and make sure that our neighborhoods remain diverse in terms of both size of structures and owner and renter balance. And so there was some production of these units, but the planning board felt that greater production would behoove the town. And so at last spring's town meeting, the planning board brought an article which would allow units up to 1,000 square feet in size or 1,100 square feet when they are ADA accessible. And this article did not pass town meeting. Um, a major argument against it was that, like a number of other zoning articles being heard at the time, town meeting didn't feel that uh, such zoning articles should be acted on because we had an incoming new form of government which would be more appropriate to take action on any such articles. And so this uh, fit into the zoning subcommittee's criteria of fairly straightforward articles. In fact, we have not made any changes to the article. It is before you today in the same form. It went to town 
meeting. This is, in fact, the report to town meeting, and what has been discussed at the zoning subcommittee is bringing forth the same article uh, verbatim, essentially for a second run with the town council. I have a couple of questions here. Um, <clears throat> first of all, um, it's all dependent on the, the house being owner occupied. So the house gets sold. How do you, does the town monitor that in fact um, it is an owner occupied house uh, connected to the accessory dwelling? Uh, so first I'd clarify that one or the other of the units needs to be owner occupied. So for instance, a situation that we've seen um, commonly is that an owner might want to downsize and still remain on their property and remain close to family and friends but rent out the principal residence. So it's in fact either of the residences that needs to be owner occupied. Uh, the building commissioner would be better suited to speak to how he might enforce owner occupancy requirements. I don't know if Chris, you could speak to that. Um, there would be conditions on the uh, permit that would state that it had to be re remain owner occupied and then um, the building commissioner receives complaints from neighbors when something like this, when property turns over and it becomes clear that the property is not owner occupied. So he would, if it were not owner occupied, receive a complaint from a neighbor and, and, and go out and enforce the uh, regulation. Um, if he became aware of this, the situation himself or his inspectors did driving around, they would also bring that back and um, the building commissioner would enforce it. I have two other questions. <clears throat> when somebody um, gets a rental permit, they have to provide parking, and there's no parking provision here, um, which wouldn't matter in most cases if it's like your, your mother or old mother in the back small dwelling, but you said no more than three adult residents, and it didn't even say they had to be related. So I could see, um, the parking problem which we observed in the, the re other rental houses developing here. A um, few comments on that. So firstly, although parking may not be explicitly mentioned in this article, that doesn't um, moot the existing parking regulations and the rest of the zoning bylaw. So those would still be in effect. And you raise a good point about the rental registration system requiring a parking plan. And if one of the dwellings were to be rented, it would require a rental permit. And so that same uh, requirement would be in effect. Uh, yeah, I was curious whether there had been any consideration or discussion as to whether the supplemental unit might in fact end up being an Airbnb type of rental as opposed to um, renting to create a housing opportunity for an individual or a small family grouping. I think that's a really good point. I don't think it's a specific concern to this article. Uh, I think it's a concern to any housing in town that may be a rental uh, and could be rented in either of the configurations that you describe. Uh, I think it's an issue that uh, is gonna need to be looked at and is being looked at from a zoning perspective and other perspectives as that issue with uh, Airbnb continues to evolve. Chris? Um, excuse me, I, I wonder if um, maybe you had this in mind but at some point, um, we could review this chart here. Uh, we did review it when Mr. Levenstein first joined the zoning subcommittee, and I think it was helpful to him to kind of know where these things came from and, and why they're on the chart. And um, maybe if we could just run through those, it might help the CRC members to understand what, what this means. Do you think that would be helpful? I think so. I'd like to give some thought to how we, what, um, depth we want to go into uh, with these items or perhaps we want to go category by category because if I recall our conversation of uh, these priorities lasted close to two hours um, which was I think um, a reasonable amount of time if we wanted to really explain each of them. So I suppose in a broad way we could go over where some of these have come from and how they receive the priorities that they are shown with in this document. Uh, the prioritization was done by the zoning subcommittee over the last several months. The articles themselves, 
probably 75% of these have some form of draft language associated with them or were the topic of a planning board study that did not result in an actual draft article going to town meeting. Uh, the categories uh, have been, for the most part, inherited from previous zoning priority charts. The one prior to this that I recall was created by uh, Jeff Bagg with a similar format where we had high, medium, and low priorities. We also looked at those in terms of uh, time frames, a short-term, medium, and long-term time frame. And the categories have remained broadly the same with housing, downtown town center, village center, zoning bylaw repair, and zoning bylaw overhaul. So, let's start there. Let's <laughs> start with. No, no, I'm trying. <laughs> that should be easy. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm, I can, the, uh, the uh, form, the graphic looks fine. I have a question under housing very directly, and um, one of the, it, it says definitions, and we're, I'm assuming much more it's mixed use buildings, defining those. And since there are many in municipalities all over the United States, very different definitions of mixed use, I was wondering what, which one are you working with? So the question or is, ones are you is which definition are we interested in revisiting under this item? Say that again, I'm sorry. So is your question which definitions we're looking to revisit under this item? So the town has looked at the definitions and requirements, standards and conditions, if you will, the next bullet point for both apartments and mixed use buildings over the past several years with the mixed use buildings, we've seen instances where there may be a fairly limited commercial element and a more significant residential element. And there's been discussion about how we want to address that and what is a reasonable balance of those two types of uses in a building. And with the apartments, an issue that we find is that the zoning bylaw is fairly restrictive when it comes to the number of units that can be provided under a apartment, uh, the number of units total and the number of units per building and so what we've seen more often are mixed use buildings that have residential units with some commercial um, component as opposed to apartments. So there's been discussion of, for instance, having different classes of apartment buildings that might be the lower density type that we now allow and then providing for a higher density type of apartments and then also looking at the mixed use uh, building issues which I mentioned. Well, uh, directly, I'm wondering how um, the, the new Spring Street building that's going to go in has a thousand square feet of commercial space um, in it, and and that doesn't seem really like mixed use. Uh, usually, it's the whole first floor of the building, or buildings are used for retail, commercial, etc. Then there might be professional offices on the second floor, and then residences, and so that seems like a better definition. I think you're touching on exactly the same concern. At yeah. some point, the planning board had a concern that we might see a building where there, for instance, is an ATM on the first floor and no other seemingly commercial use, and the bylaw does not you know, speak clearly to that scenario, and that's one of the reasons that we think it's a high priority to look at this issue. Thank you. And the opposite, where it's primarily commercial with a, you know, very few living rooms. So. Those are mixed use. We all know what mixed use. <laughs> those up on the wall behind you. Know, those are mixed use buildings as we define it. And so where that's in a way that's what we try to get to. But we also have to recognize that. You know, commercial operations the, are also changing. You know, in other words, like the idea that you have to go to a brick and mortar store. So it's a very complicated issue that, because I think we all. Know what we want. We want. Um, the, the good old days, but getting there is, you know, is really difficult. Okay. Chris. We do have specific requirements for mixed use buildings in the commercial district, and uh, they um, don't allow more than a certain amount of residential use on the ground floor. Um, so for some reason, the commercial district was considered to be very sensitive in terms of um, allowing mixed use buildings, but we haven't delved into that downtown. Although a few years ago, the Planning Board did come forth with a zoning amendment that included um, definitions for how much of the ground floor needed to be a non-residential use 
And then they also um, included the fact that some part of that non-residential use could be parking. And I think um, it was interesting because that uh, amendment went down to defeat at town meeting. And I think it went down to defeat over the issue of parking because some people didn't like the idea of parking being included in a mixed-use building. But in my personal opinion, I think that we're all thinking that we need to provide parking for these buildings. And if one of the places that, that can be provided is in the building, that makes sense. And in fact, One East Pleasant Street actually has parking on part of its ground floor. So it has res restaurants up in front and then parking in the back on the ground floor and the rest of the building is residential. So if we could try to capture the percentages of that building, maybe that, not, not in terms of the, I'm not talking about the height or the setback or anything, just the percentages, that might be a direction that we want to go in. But uh, referring to the pictures on the wall, um, you can see that it's a more equal balance yeah. than what we have recently have built. Have you know? And and um, I would love it if those had been built. Church and Ripley. Well, that's the two of us. <laughs> and uh, we'll start with the bank. Uh, so the, the, so there's a couple of things. So one is the absolutely the model that. Uh, retail on the ground floor, offices on the second floor, residences above is sort of the classic mixed-use building type. So there, there are a few things. I mean, there are lots of cultural changes that that doesn't happen anymore. So a lot of those second floor occupants were people like dentists and doctors, and the way that dog medicine is, you know, practiced now is simply, you know, simply is different. Um, also, the way that buildings are built. So, you know, it's typical now that there be sort of a hardened ground floor, like the first floor, like it's called podium, podium building. Yeah, and then the upper floors are different construction types. So it's harder to, because builders are also trying to, you know, build as economically as they can to make, to build, you know, to make sense. So we've seen that in some of the new buildings downtown where there's sort of a hardened ground floor. The One East Pleasant and um, Kendrick Place and Boltwood Place all have that. And then the upper floors are a different construction material, which means that they all are housing, so you can't mix again the uses. So yeah, so I might propose, and Steve, see if you agree, a way to approach the rest of these items. There are a lot of them. I thought we might work our way across the highest priority items in the top row. Um, we're gonna aim for, I think, wrapping this up around 6.30, so we have about 35 minutes and see if we can get through as many of those items as possible, and if we get through that whole first tier, move on to the second. Yes. I just wanted to also introduce the topic of the fact that the Zoning Subcommittee has been um, interested in hearing from the CRC about what the CRC's vision is for um, zoning amendments moving forward, and is there a role for the zoning subcommittee in the initiation of zoning amendments? Um, in other words, is the CRC going to be reviewing zoning amendments after they're proposed to town council, or does the CRC envision that it is going to be the initiating body? Um, so that's one question. You don't have to solve that tonight, but I think that's an important question. Um, the second question is, does the CRC and the town council feel that the zoning subcommittee might benefit from being expanded in some way? And that was something that the building commissioner touched on earlier in his presentation to you. In other words, um, instead of just having um, three members or five members from the planning board, um, also incorporating you know, a member of the town council or incorporating a business person or someone who manages property. Um, similar to the way the rental registration um, process uh, was, was built. Um, there was a kind of a large group, I think 20 people altogether, who met on a weekly or monthly basis and developed the rental registration program. Um, and the building commissioner is aware that in other cities and towns they, they do have um, a zoning subcommittee of some sort, but it includes members of the community. So, I think that's another thing that um, 
the zoning subcommittee is curious about. Are you, is the CRC interested in exploring that as a possibility um, and, and making the zoning subcommittee even more of a robust group that is representative of the town? So um, I guess I'm bringing those two topics up because I know we're gonna get into a lot of detail once we start looking at this chart, but those are two issues that I think the zoning subcommittee would appreciate some input from the CRC, perhaps not at this meeting, perhaps at another meeting. It seems like this would be a worthwhile thing to continue for these two groups to meet together. Yeah, so we're, we're advisor to the town council and we get our marching orders from, my president's sitting here, but we get our marching orders from the, <laughs> from the, the town council. So any, any kind of expansion like that, because to get to the charge of where we are, you know, it took a long time of making this a council, basically, I, I'm sorry, a committee of the council. Uh, one thing I know that there is missing is that we would like to have, and I can't speak for the council, but I believe that there's a slot for a liaison from the town council to the zoning subcommittee specifically, or historically there was a select board, or at least there was a proposal for that. Um, but a liaison from the town council to your zoning subcommittee, I think would help, you know, a, a lot. And then the zoning subcommittee is your construct, so you can do with that as you see fit. But I believe that we have that interest in having a liaison to you, and whether or not it be from the, the CRC here, or whether or not it be from the remaining town council members, that's up for discussion. But the rest, uh, we can certainly take back to the full town council to discuss, unless, unless you. We're planning to have our own retreat at some point, and that would be a great question too. Maria. I just wanna throw in that um, that would actually be really helpful, as well as having other sort of more objective members, because zoning bylaws are such a complex and maze-like thing that to just jump in or just to hear articles sort of without understanding the full sort of history and story behind it is a lot. Mm -hmm. So having that continuity or someone that, you know, sort of in the meeting, seeing how it's being processed and formed would be great. Um, rather than, you know, suddenly throwing in your lap, you know, a pile of articles and you have to quickly think about them. Yeah, just wanna throw that in there. I agree with you, and I also feel strongly that um, you should develop your committee, as you said, the way you see fit, and having other members that would support the work is, I think, critical. I also um, would love to see um, people from CRC working with you in collaboration as we look at things over time. So yes, somebody on the committee, other, um, who worked long term, but also that we really will need to collaborate with you. Great, thank you. And I understand that this is an evolving process. Does the charge of the CRC speak specifically currently to its role in zoning? Mm -hmm. oh, very much. Yeah. Can we recognize? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just want to be clear that a couple things. First of all, if a council member is a liaison to this committee or any other committee, unless specified differently, they would not be a voting member, right. okay? Uh, and in their role as liaison, uh, while it's important <coughs> that they um, contribute to your thinking, it's also important that they are not seen as a voice of the council unless it has previously been discussed at the council and a vote's been taken. And finally, one of the major things is to help bring back to the council issues that should be brought to the council's attention and possibly lead to an actual meeting where we would ask a committee of some kind to come and meet with the council. So I just wanna clarify, we have not voted on those guidelines, but those have been uh, presented to us at least once and um, seem to be very consistent with how the previous select board had liaisons to boards. Thank you for that. All right, shall we start moving yeah. through these? So we started with the uh, top priority housing articles and talked about apartments and mixed use buildings. 
The next item there is the 40 yard district planning process and I believe a number of counselors and others in town attended the recent forum that was held on 40 r smart growth and the underlying idea here is that it may behoove the town to look into implementing a 40 r to provide a more diverse housing stock that would include um, mandatorily uh, affordable housing units and so the town is working with consultants and has been awarded a grant to further explore that notion um, which ties into a number of the items in the next uh, box downtown down downtown and town center so form-based code is another issue that's been of great interest to the planning board and sub zoning subcommittee for some time um, being codes that would dictate more the uh, makeup and look of the town as it evolves and less the the use underlying and we've seen that in particular in regards to the downtown and town center where a number of voices in town have looked for more uh, consistency and predictability in the way that the downtown takes shape and the zoning subcommittee uh, share that interest and I think uh, Maria in particular has looked at uh, form-based code and ways we might um, go down that path. It's one that the town has explored before, looking into implementing form-based code in some of the village centers. The, that proposal did not end up being passed by town meeting, but a lot was learned. Uh, and there's some valuable material available to the town on form-based code through that. Uh, moving on, landscape standards. These are all, again, this could relate to form-based code, the landscape standards, the setback, maximum floors, height modifications, are all things that we might look to further and better define in the downtown, and that could be done through form-based code. Mixed-use building standards and conditions relate to the discussion we had previously about mixed-use buildings, but are a particular concern for the downtown because they have been occurring there with greater frequency than other parts of town. Uh, transition zones and the BL zone. So our core zoning district is the BG or general business district which allows for the greatest density in town and it has on its outlying uh, borders a number of zones known as the limited business zone or BL. Those are at uh, South Prospect along North Pleasant where it um, branches off with Halleck and north of Triangle Street. And so there's been some look at these zones and whether the zoning there is appropriate because in fact a lot of what exists in those zones now, even that which many find appealing, could not now be built under our current zoning. In particular because the minimum lot area requirements for residential units are so onerous. A number of uh, parcels there could not be developed for the reason of the residential units. Um, limits and also because of the setback limits. We've seen some presentations by those um, proposing projects in that part of town that show how difficult it is to uh, develop. And so the thought is that it may be appropriate to look at these areas and find a density and a form that is not as dense as the BG district, but creates a transition from that district into the neighboring residential areas. Yes. I, I need you to go slower on the issues you're talking about in the BL district. Um, you've said some things that some things made it difficult to build on. Um, number one, can you not preserve some of the houses there? Do they have to be knocked down? Um, I didn't. You, you went, I just didn't get all the ideas. So I'd sure. like a much slower discussion of, of this because this is an area I'm very interested in. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't think there's any, been any discussion of knocking down uh, houses per se, but there's been look at the fact that what now exists could not be built because of our current zoning. So two examples are uh, a residence that may have four residential units in it where the lot area in fact allows zero residential units. And another common impediment is the setbacks. So we've been shown presentations where a large number of the buildings, and I'm speaking now mostly about that um, corridor of North Pleasant Street, um, a large number of those buildings exist within setbacks. So they would not be able to be sited where they sit on the parcel now under our current zoning. Again, they're too close to the sidewalk, too far from the sidewalk, which are they? Too close. They're too close. Yeah. So if you built something new there, it would be further from the sidewalk. Is that correct? If but the then current... I'm, but, but the, I, 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 don't, I don't know a lot of things. Okay. The new buildings that have been built are right up 
into the sidewalk. So those were built into the sidewalk. I, what's the rule? It's a different zone. So, so why, okay, so this was a formerly residential area. It is a residential area. People live there in houses, the White Houses, the BO, on North Pleasant, yeah. Okay, so if you were going to build, are you, this, do you have to build apartment buildings there? Do you have to do it on both sides of Kendrick Park? Well, I guess an underlying point I want to be clear about is that the town doesn't do any building. What the town does is look to see what it wants to allow, how it wants to promote that, and other entities do the building. I think, again, the thought is that it has been a goal of the town for many decades to focus development to the town centers. And these areas that we're describing, the BLs, have barriers to any sort of redevelopment, even if it's of the scale that currently exists. Mm -hmm. And the Planning Board and Zoning Subcommittee have felt it a worthwhile conversation to determine what type of development is appropriate there, what type of density, what type of form. And the two tools we've discussed today, form-based code and the 40R district could really go a long way towards addressing what I see as uh, shared goals of the town, which are promoting a mix of housing options and providing affordable housing. But with form-based code, I believe, means you pay some attention to what's around it. But now what's around it are some new apartment buildings. So does that mean to go with the neighborhood that's around that this one block in or to go with the new buildings on the other side of the park? So I would actually say the best examples of form based code are where there is no there there. So in other words, form based code has been used successfully say to redevelopment strip malls or, or their mash P common is an example in Massachusetts, which was on a site of a one story shopping center and it has largely been you know, redeveloped as a mixed use, multi-story, not unlike, not unlike that. So I think the trap that we're in actually is that our, our one of our, some of our conditions say that new buildings shall look like the surroundings, but if the surroundings aren't what we want it to look like, then it's sort of a head scratcher that we've come across sometimes on planning board that if the next door neighbor is a Sunoco station, we don't want the apartment building to look like a Sunoco station. I hope I haven't, anyone own a Sunoco? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's mobile. Oh, you know, Maria? Oh, I just want to add that form-based zoning is not sort of like a looking at spots or parcels. It actually takes a lot of time. Consultants look at the big picture. They study streets. They study streetscapes. It's not just sort of thinking about, well, what's directly next to it and what's, yeah. you know. So it's a real big picture kind of um, design based on sort of urban scale thinking. And um, so it takes everything from the street, the curb, the sidewalk, the trees, you know, the, the signage, the canopy, the number of stories. And so it's, it's almost, you know, that's why I keep harping on it. It's sort of the solution to all our problems. If we can um, somehow, you know, move, I mean, it's, it's a huge undertaking. So it's really, um, but it, it really does address all of those kinds of things you're asking from everything from, you know, this whole sort of block box under downtown town center, in my mind, all could be resolved with one base zone, to be fair. <laughs> so there, there is, so in the presentation earlier um, with Rob and Chris, I thought that zoning came to Amherst in 1940, but uh, it was 1920, mid 1920. But there's a certain irony that the part of Amherst that we know and love, that's on all the postcards and in all the books, was built prior to zoning. So zoning came along in 1925. Every building you love was built before 1925. Well, okay, every building that many of us love <laughs> was built before 1925. So we used to know how to build community before we got zoning. And I, I, that sounds like a joke, but it's actually not a joke because we tried to rationalize and we tried to map, we tried to make mathematical formulas for how to build cities and we failed. And so form-based zoning has recognized that we have failed at building good communities through zoning and is trying to um, repair that. So we, there, there's an, I mean, I keep pointing at that, but that was built all prior to zoning. Maria? I just wanna add, um, form-based zoning is interesting that it's really designed for the human scale. It really thinks about how a person occupies a space and a streetscape 
Whereas a lot of the zoning um, dealing with easements and setbacks and height restrictions, it's you know, like she said, it's all math and it forgets about like how a person experiences a street. So yeah, it, it's, a, it's a real design endeavor and it really looks at all of that. Good conversation on that item. Uh, shall we move on? Okay, so the next is parking requirements, and this is an issue that many in town are looking at. Uh, the Zoning Subcommittee and the Planning Board have recognized for a long time that zoning has a role to play in parking, the parking system in our town. And in particular, there's been a lot of interest in looking at the Municipal Parking District, which has been expanded both in terms of geographic area and what it allows, what it doesn't require over the years. And uh, conversations at the Planning Board and Zoning Subcommittee recently have in particular focused on, well, perhaps we want to have more of a parking requirement than we now do, and also perhaps allow for a provision of uh, payment in lieu of some parking. And we see municipalities around the state and the country have systems similar to this. Again, this is a small piece of a very big picture, a very complicated one, but it's definitely a high priority as indicated by the chart. Village centers, um, we again tried to prioritize those village centers which have been identified over the years, I think originally in the SCOG plan back in the 70s identified the village centers of Amherst. And so we were trying through this chart to say which we felt were the most high priority. And North Amherst, has been a topic of much discussion and many proposals, including the previous form-based code proposals. And so there's been um, a lot of focus there, also on the roadways there. We've seen some development, so this seems like an area where we want to continue to monitor and be involved in its development. East Amherst has been uh, less of a focus of uh, regulatory changes over the years. We see a little bit of new interest in development there, but we also see a lot of uh, lack of development and some structures that are maybe getting beyond their useful life and a part of town that could really be better utilized. And so that's why this finds its way towards the top of our priorities. We mentioned again, mixed use building standards and conditions. That's the same item. In this case, as it relates to village centers, we see village centers where mixed use buildings are being located. Uh, it was mentioned that the commercial district in the North Amherst Village Center handles those a little bit differently but we would like to bring uh, uniform regulations and some more predictability to mixed use buildings in these other village centers as well. Parking requirements, same issue as before. Do we want to, even though these village centers do not have the equivalent of a municipal parking district, do we want to look at how parking is required in those areas, perhaps require less parking um, in those areas? Because again, there's no current exemption as there is in the downtown. Uh, zoning bylaw repair. Um, at various times over the years, we've called this technical fixes. A lot of these are items that got brought to our attention by the building commissioner or planning staff as um, issues where more clarity could be provided or it's uh, causing a, a problem for staff or for the planning board. And the first item here is expanding the use of graphics in the zoning bylaw. And in the same way that form-based code could be useful, our zoning bylaw could be updated to include more graphics that would illustrate what exactly it is saying and be more clear. We've seen this in communities like Northampton. We've had some great conversations with our friends who are involved in planning in Northampton and they've spoken about the processes they've been going through to introduce more graphics into their bylaw and it, um, it seems a worthy goal. Parking requirements per unit, again, same issue as we've described. Marijuana cultivation use, this uh, was placed on this chart prior to the drafting of the document that you've seen today, but it just goes to show that this has been on the radar of the Planning Board Zoning Subcommittee and a number of concerned parties in town for some time looking again at the marijuana regulations and making it easier to cite cultivation uses in the town. And zoning bylaw overhaul, these would be big fixes. Um, so form-based code, either specific to the downtown or village centers or other areas of town, generally incorporating that code into the bylaw. We've known for some time that Article 8 of the zoning bylaw, the sign section, is in need of a rewrite. There's a lot of language in there, which I believe has posed challenging to the building commissioner in his enforcement efforts. 
At one point, funding was requested of town meeting for a rewrite by an outside consultant. That uh, funding was not approved. As I understand it, staff is, has this rewrite on their priority list. Um, bylaw reformatting and e-code. The reformatting includes potentially expanding the use of graphics, also potentially modifying the way the code is available and presented to the public. There are a number of communities in the area that use what's called e-code. It's a, some might say, more easily searchable uh, document. Our zoning bylaw right now exists in a PDF format on the town's website and is available in hard copy to boards, committees, and citizens. But uh, many believe that e-code could provide some benefits. Chris? If people are interested in exploring that, um, they might wish to go to the Northampton we website because um, Northampton uses eCode and it's, um, it's, it's pretty useful and you can search it pretty easily. Thank you. Uh, master plan update, another very large picture item which has been taken up by the town council. Uh, there was a presentation last week on this, so it's certainly of interest to the planning board as the planning board would have a role in any um, master plan updates. So we'd like to continue the conversation with the CRC and the council about the master plan process and what our goals might be for that. So we finished the kind of highest priority items here and I thought I might just stop and see if there's questions or comments before we move on to this next here. Okay. We'll move ahead, yes. I had a question. Um, in talking about mixed-use buildings, which is what is going up, somebody pointed out that part of that code was that um, the upper stories don't have to be built as strongly as the lower stories, and that therefore they could not be converted to condos where people could buy the apartments. Is that correct? So that's a building code issue, and I think Steve might be able to speak to it. I may be someone that has perpetuated that story, but it, there is some truth to that, that the um, expectations of people who own apartments is different than the expectations of people that uh, rent apartments. And so they probably would be constructed different. And I can't comment on the buildings that have been built, because mm -hmm. plenty of apartment buildings have been converted to you know, condominiums and, and vice versa. So I can't comment on any existing, but that is generally an expectation that um, renters have different standards than owners. Also, um, if you have a building full of owners, the um, potential for legal action for you know, um, characteristics of the building that are not, <laughs> what am I saying? The, the um, possibility of being sued is much higher in a building full of owners rather than a building full of renters. Yeah, I think all good points, and I would mention also that that has been a topic of discussion at the Planning Board and Zoning Subcommittee also. Specifically, at one point when we were talking about form-based code, we wondered whether it might be possible to uh, incentivize more owner-occupied units. Again, the issue is that you get into more issues of the building code than the zoning which are, are separate matters, but it's of interest, it has been of interest to the board and the subcommittee to promote that type of unit in town. Well, because <clears throat> if, you, if you want to have um, a really strong center, you, if, you, if, you want, if one of the goals is to have places downtown where people who presently live in houses but want to downsize, they would be much more interested in a condominium apartment building than a rental building. And I don't think that anything that's been built recently is attractive to those people. And it's, I think we have a lot of people who are potentially in that group. I just wanted to uh, piggyback on what Mr. Shriver was saying before about um, the way buildings are built. The new buildings that are being built downtown have um, a steel framework for the first floor. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, second through fifth floor um, is a wood framework. So that wood framework is less um, adaptable to uh, being used for offices and other uses besides residential uses. All right, so moving on to this next row of housing. These are moderate priority items. 
So townhouses and apartments by right in more zones. So this would be a way of providing more multifamily units throughout the town. Right now, the permitting standards for both of these townhouses and apartments are relatively strict. And if we want to see more multifamily housing in town as a means to improve the diversity of the housing stock and promote affordability, this might be one approach. Uh, exploring the floor area ratio as an alternative to units per acre. So our density for the most part in town is dictated by how many units can occur per acre. And this change would instead look at the ratio of the floor area of the building to the area of the parcel on which it is sited. And it's a formula that's used in many cities and towns around the country. A multifamily overlay district for non-conforming apartment complexes so we have a number of apartment complexes in town that were built uh, under a more lax uh, permitting standard. It was easier for them to be permitted at some time, often in the 70s and 80s. And since then, at some point, the town said that it was less interested in that type of development. And so many of these existing apartment complexes are non-conforming. And so when they want to make any sort of change, it's very difficult for them. And so if we wanted to promote density in those areas, which makes a lot of sense because many of the apartment complexes are located close to transportation, close to services, and already have a certain density to them, if there was interest in further densifying those areas, this would be one way um, to approach that. Uh, PURD overlay, that's a planned unit residential overlay, and we have a number of those in town. And I believe this question, this item may have related specifically to Echo Hill, where there was a PURD, but now finds itself in a similar circumstance to the apartments I described, um, where the prior regulation, regulatory path is no longer available. Is that right, Chris? Um, so Echo Hill was developed as a PURD, most of Echo Hill, not, not including the uh, single family homes um, uh, near Pelham Road, but the smaller single family homes and the uh, townhouses were developed as part of a PURD um, with a special permit, but they don't have an overlay zone over them. And so now um, those are being considered to be non conforming. So every time somebody wants to do make a change to his home, he is likely to have to go through the special permit process since the home is non conforming. So the effort would be to apply a PURD overlay uh, to this area to allow it to be considered conforming. Um, other areas in town which have PURD overlays can uh, take advantage of, of the, the flexibility that's allowed by the PURD. And moving on to additional lot area per unit, uh, my understanding is this relates to a particular uh, footnote of the bylaw, footnote M, that requires more lot area per unit in certain parts of town and that that footnote was introduced because of concern about a development uh, Spruce Ridge on High Street in Amherst, which I believe by all measures has been successful. It um, allowed greater density and there have not been issues that I'm aware of with the development, but it was felt that perhaps that was too much density for that area of town. And so there's been stricter regulation of uh, developments of that density in these residential neighborhoods. And so the planning board has thought of looking at that and is this, this higher threshold in fact appropriate? Should we allow more uh, units like Spruce Ridge of that density in these residential neighborhoods? And I believe the apartment versus duplex note refers to the notion that we might uh, regulate those two types of uses differently and have different additional lot area per unit requirements for those two different types of developments. And then moving on to the moderate priority items under downtown and town center, outdoor seasonal entertainment. We see and the ZBA sees a number of applications for businesses that want to have these uses, outdoor seasonal entertainment and outdoor dining by right. And those are only allowed to happen between April and November. There may be uh, some reason to look at those regulations and open them up a bit. We want to have a vibrant downtown and we want people to be able to enjoy it, and this would be one way to improve that function. Uh, RG zone density variation. So this relates a bit to a previous issue about the additional lot area per unit. So right now, our general residence district is a very large district, and we see across it essentially a number of sub-districts in terms of the physical form. 
and the planning board and zoning subcommittee had thought it potentially worthwhile to look at dividing the zone up into multiple zones that more accurately reflect the reality as it's been built on the ground in that district. Form-based code in village centers, we've already touched on, the notion of bringing form-based code to the village centers, same with mixed-use building standards and conditions. Uh, zoning bylaw repair, lot sizes, hydrology, septic systems. This relates to an issue that came up at last spring's town meeting where a concerned property owner was looking to have essentially those parcels that were not served by septic or town water um, down zoned and so the planning board considered this found the particular approach that was taken by the petitioner problematic but felt that it was worthwhile to explore the underlying issue of whether there's hydrologic concerns in the area and if this should be approached in a different way uh, zoning bylaw rewrite um, this would be a comprehensive look at the zoning bylaw and it's something that a number of uh, parties in town have suggested over the years it would be a, a large project I think we've been floated some numbers for how much this would cost in the neighborhood of 250 to 300 thousand dollars staff might have a more specific number on that probably not that much I think we were estimating about a hundred thousand although we don't have current information about that so this would be a large undertaking uh, the flood prone conservancy district this is something we're going to have to deal with uh, in the near future because our flood maps the fema flood insurance rate maps have recent are in the process of being revised so they're more accurate to the, the physical reality on the ground today but an entailment of this is that we have our flood prone conservancy or fpc district which was based on the previous flood lines and so when the new flood lines are adopted we will have a zone that is out of conformity with what exists on the ground and so we'll be faced with the question of whether we want to adapt the flood prone conservancy district lines to comport with the updated flood lines which could make will make some areas of town less buildable and some more buildable and this actually came up at a recent zoning subcommittee meeting and the notion of having the flood prone conservancy district be an overlay zone rather than a base zone was also discussed and the reason that would be beneficial is because when this FPC if, uh, issue comes up, not only are we going to have to decide whether we want to move lines to comport with the new flood lines, but where a new underlying zone is revealed, essentially, if the FPC is removed, we would have to determine what base zone goes where that FPC used to be. But one way to address any future changes that could happen to the FPC would be to make the FPC an overlay and specify the underlying zones at this point and simply say that the FPC restrictions apply on top of those underlying zones. So we've managed to work our way through another whole row here and it's about 6.30. So um, do people have comments or questions on this? I'd like to just have a few minutes at the end to talk about next steps and we're getting towards the end of our time. Andy? I just wanted to thank you for the presentation. It was very informative and very uh, important for us. And just to share an observation, maybe getting into the next topic, but uh, having been involved in town meeting in various capacities over a long period of time, I'd always been concerned that town meeting as a large body uh, would not really be in a position to understand easily very complicated information and concepts that the planning board was working with. And I uh, really, one of the things that excites me about our new form of government is that I think that we have the capacity with the smaller council and with our committee to really um, understand more quickly and more easily um, what the role uh, w that you have and the information you have and make the transition from your role in dealing with the zoning change to the council's role a lot easier than it has been. So this is a great first step. Thank you. Thanks. I agree. All right. Yes, Chris. I just have sort of a, I guess it's a detail or a housekeeping item. I'm not exactly sure how to categorize it, but the 
You're probably aware that the bylaw review committee has been working on um, making the zoning bylaw and the general bylaw comport with the town charter. And um, they uh, presented um, a document to the planning board in December um, that did bring the zoning bylaw into compliance with the charter. And um, I, I believe that they are going to be um, eagerly hoping to present that to you uh, soon. So it needs to go to the planning board first. Even though it went to the planning board in December, because town council didn't act within 90 days, it has to go back to the planning board and then the planning board makes a recommendation to you. I believe it's actually gonna come to you first and I don't know what exactly the time schedule is, but here's what I think. I think the bylaw review, review committee will present this uh, changed bylaw to you first, then it will come to the planning board for a public hearing, and I think we're hoping for a public hearing on June 5th, and then the planning board would uh, make its recommendation to you, and then you would vote, hopefully, to agree with what the planning board was presenting. And it was, would only be after that that you would actually have an intact zoning bylaw that could then be amended. So we wouldn't be recommending any amendments to you prior to your um, adopting this, um, this, this new, I don't want to call it new, but this uh, zoning bylaw that's more in keeping with the charter. That's more than housekeeping. Great, thank you so much for that. And thanks to the CRC for joining us today. I hope this is the first of many such meetings, and I hope also that if you have thoughts or questions on how we might proceed on these zoning issues, that you'll relay that to us and appreciate your work with us on this. So to quote from Casablanca, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful relationship. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so thank you so much. And with that, we'll close the uh, joint meeting of the two bodies. Steve, you need to ask for adjournment. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn the CRC meeting? I second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor? Thanks again. Thank you. So the next item on our agenda is the zoning subcommittee is the zoning subcommittee work plan and report. I believe we've gone into much detail about our, our work plan today. Oh, thank you. Well done, Greg. Um, I suppose I would just ask uh, David if you have any updates for us on that. Uh, I have failed miserably in producing on a deadline that was already postponed. 